to see a good turnout for an afternoon session. Uh, I had a feeling there was going to be a good interest, or a lot of interest in this subject. My sister, who's just about three years younger than I am, uh, lived in uh, Pleasant Valley, and Pleasant Valley is just a few miles east of Clackamas. And her youngest daughter, Debbie, started the uh, first grade at Pleasant Valley Grade School, and she immediately became friends with a young girl her age named Diana, Deanna, I think Diana, I think it's Diana Moffat. And through the years of high school, grade school and high school, uh, Deanna and Debbie just were the best friends all the way through. And Gail Moffat is the mother of Deanna, Diana, and Gail and my sister became really good friends. And one day, about the time these kids were about 10 years later, probably around 16, Diana went to a teenage dance in Portland and never came home. She was uh, recruited or whatever the word might be, uh, and pimped into this prostitution ring. And she was in Portland for quite a while. And she did keep in touch with her mother indirectly through postcards or whatever. So she let her mom know where she was. And uh, she started moving across the country. And she would let her mom know that she was OK and she was in such and such a place. And time went by, and she was last heard from in Florida. And. Gail was really upset because time went by and a lot of time went by and she never heard from her daughter at all. She kind of knew what was going on. And one day, uh, the Portland City Police came to her and said, your daughter has been found in a trash heap in San Diego. Consequently, long story short, this whole story was made into a movie, a, a Tele for a movie for television and was broadcast in 1993 and it was produced in Portland. So, you know, then just a couple of, a couple of years ago I read this book by, uh, what's his name, Patterson, about uh, the name of the book was Filthy Rich. It's about Jeffrey Epstein, so you know what the deal is there. And just to bring you up to date, we have an I-5 corridor right here where there's a lot of sex trafficking of minors. And so I'd like to introduce Jim. And unbeknownst to me, until just a few minutes ago, Jim brought two young ladies to help him with this presentation. And there's Deanna Clark and, I forgot your name already, that's terrible, Esther Nelson. So they're going to be up on the stage later. Uh, Jim is a retired Head of Staff of the Western, excuse me, Westminster Presbyterian Church in Portland. <laughs> All right, he has he has one he has one parishioner, oh, parishioner. <laughs> parishioner. <laughs> so Jim also is on the anti anti sex trafficking committee of East Portland Rotary, and Dana Clark is also in the East Salem Rotary Club. And she's been in that club for a long time, and so has Jim. And Jim got, seven years ago, Jim got involved with this anti-sex trafficking committee. And by the way, he's also a board member of the Institute for Christian Muslim Understanding. Jim went to Whitworth College where he got his bachelor's. He went to San Francisco Theological Seminary where he got a master's in divinity. And he went to the San Francisco Theological Seminary where he got his doctorate in ministry. So seven years ago, he decided that he would join this group in the East Portland Rotary Club about the anti-sex trafficking and the invisible evil in that area, which is juvenile sex trafficking. So please welcome Jim Moiso from Portland. Please give him an ICL warm welcome. probably mispronounced your name. No, it was right on. 
Well, thank you all for having us here this afternoon. Um, if the video doesn't work, we'll still do it because we've got uh, a lot of things we can talk about. Um, Dana, um, it, it, who's here with us, um, and you'll hear from a bit later, is actually the chair of our committee. And um, I, I want to ask you a few questions as we begin, just to sort of ricochet some things back and forth. How, how many of you um, know uh, or have dealt with this issue in your work or as a volunteer? OK. How, how many of you have had to face it um, or heard stories about it from family or friends? Okay. How many of you aren't sure that you want to be here this afternoon because it's going to be so depressing? <laughs> we want to try to answer questions that you might have about this. So a bit later, um, I'll ask you if you have questions um, that, that we haven't covered. Um, we want to introduce you to the situation that we live in. And it's mostly hidden and secret. And we want to give you some clues about what's being done and leave you with ideas and options for you to explore individually or in groups or in other organizations um, to learn more and to become involved in this whole issue. Now, obviously, most of what we present concerns Portland and the metro area because that's where most of the study has taken place and also where we operate. Um, but as has already, as already been mentioned, um, Salem is in that mix. Um, it's the I-5 and 84 and that sort of thing. So we're all in the mix. So this is going to be really quick, and I just want you to kind of hang on, and and because um, there'll be more, I think, than 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 we can deal with. By the way, I also need to say at the beginning, um, I don't like talking about this. This is we've done it for several years now, and. This is really hard for me to talk about. It's hard for me to imagine and believe that it happens because the whole thing is so enormously egregious, um, what we do to children. So I started talking, or getting involved in this issue about seven years ago. And at that point, I knew nothing. My wife and I and our three children um, were living in Portland, which is a great, clean family city. And we, it's a wholesome place to raise children, unlike some of those other cities that are not. I mean, we, know, we can name them. Um, and, and Portland is this great place. And what I realized was that I was totally ignorant. Well, almost. Because when we moved to Portland in 1972, I remember remarking to somebody that I was looking forward to the Rose Festival, my first one. And somebody said, oh yeah, that's when the Navy comes up the river to spawn. And people still laugh when that gets said. People still laugh. Yeah, there's that river. And there's 84, and there is I-5, a freeway for sex and drug trafficking, and there's Portland International Airport. And Salem's right on this line. Um, and you can remember a couple of years ago, the FBI did a, a nationwide child exploitation task force. They did a sting nationwide. Remember the, reading about that? And they worked with the Salem and Kaiser Police Departments and the Polk County Law Enforcement. And in the process, they actually recovered two child victims here. Um, so, when, when is a child considered trafficked? Well, basically it's rather simple. It's when there's an exchange made for sex. Any kind of exchange. It doesn't have to be money. It can be drugs, it can be alcohol, it can be housing. So, you're on the street and you're cold and you're wet and here's this nice person who comes along and says, why don't you come home with me? I can give you a nice dry place and get you off the street. It's really cold and, and you're, you're really hungry. And so why don't you come? Exchange for housing, okay? It can be exchanged for food, for any kind of exchange. Um, that's commercial sex trafficking. And we're talking basically today about people who are under 18. We're not talking about adults. Um, and we also need to know that the, these kids are any gender and, uh, or gender orientation. It's not just cute little girls or young women. Um, what does it include? What does child sex trafficking include? It includes street prostitution. Now, 
Portland's had a reputation over the years that 82nd Avenue, and some of you may be familiar with that, is the place where all the street walkers are. Well, if you go there now, it's mostly empty. And we'll talk about why. It includes child pornography and strip clubs. And we can talk about them if you want to. It includes erotic and nude massage parlors, and we can tell a story about one of those. It includes online advertising, which is where it all now focuses. So for example, if I'm flying into Salem this afternoon, I can go online and have an appointment with some young thing waiting for me at the hotel in, Port in Salem when I get there today, online. It's gang-related trafficking, because gangs have discovered that trafficking um, is incredibly lucrative. And the difference between selling people and selling drugs is you sell drugs once, and you may go to jail for it if you get caught. You sell drugs once and they're gone. With a kid, you can sell him over and over and over and over. It also has to do with family exploitation. There are parents, um, particularly second generation people who have been trafficked, who sell their children for a whole lot of reasons. They market their own kids. Um, so it, it, it's big and it's also not visible. How large is this problem here? Quite simply, we don't know. Because victims <laughs> hide. <laughs> I mean, they don't come out and say, guess what, I'm being trafficked. No, they hide. And their traffickers want them hidden. And so it's only, we can only estimate and guess for certain kinds of things. Here's what we do know, and it's startling to me. One in seven endangered runaways reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, one in seven in 2013, was likely to become sex trafficked, one in seven. In that group alone, it means in this country, if that's true, 157,000 kids that year in the United States were being trafficked that they could identify. It doesn't include kids that have run away that aren't reported as missing. And there are lots of them. In Portland, if somebody comes from Salem and they goes down, go downtown to Portland, to Pioneer Courthouse Square or any other place on the street, um, they will likely be contacted by a trafficker within 48 hours. So who are the victims? Um, any child, any person, they're anybody. They're from all races, they're from all socioeconomic levels, um, they're from all kinds of educations. They're kids who are most vulnerable, who are, and they're at risk. Ages of entry, average, 12 to 14 years old for girls, 11 to 13 for boys. We're talking about seventh graders. Seventh graders. The life expectancy on the street for a person being trafficked, about seven years because of suicide and drugs and violence and disease. 90% of youth who self-disclosed, that is, who came in contact with some group and told them about themselves, 90% had been sexually abused before they were trafficked. 90%. 60% of them have experienced domestic violence of some kind. Getting depressed yet? Okay. Just in sheer raw figures, which just makes me... Mm. If a girl starts at 12, by the time she can get her driver's license, she has been trafficked 4,000 times. Think about what that does to an adolescent's self-esteem, self-worth, to their brains, to their hearts. 
and it's happening right now. In a PSU study in our area in 2013, along with the Attorney General's office, they identified um, 469 victims that they could identify in our area um, over a period of years. 96.4% were female, 2.8% were male, and 9% were transgendered. Now this was what was interesting to me as I began to sort of blow stereotypes for me. The largest group are Caucasians. More than 40% were Caucasians. Second largest group were African Americans at 27%. And that doesn't sound like much until you realize that the African American population in the metro area is 5.8%. So 27%, 5.8, it's way out of proportion. 5.1% were Hispanics. The youngest, hang on, the youngest was eight. How many of you have an eight-year-old grandchild, third grade? That makes me sick in my stomach. At least 50% of those being trafficked were gang affiliated. I told you why. And over 11% of the victims in Multnomah County were trafficked by their own families. Twenty nineteen sheriff's statistics in Multnomah County: five hundred and ninety-five minor victims over several years. How many traffickers do you think are around? I was asked this question a while back: that they could identify. Remember, they also try to be secret. That they could identify how many would be in that area. I said, "Oh, maybe one hundred and fifty," which seemed like a lot to me. Well, over a 10-year period, they could identify 1,059 suspected traffickers. Children and adults, traffickers. And in that period, 949 cited buyers. They're called Johns. They cited 949 in the last 10 years. Um, let me say something about Johns, the buyers. Um, people like me. I mean that. Demand always drives supply. If there were no demand, there would be no supply. So what do you want to work on? It's kind of like the war on drugs, you know? If you could, if you could get people to stop buying, they wouldn't be coming into the country. It's, this is true of this too. 99% of the buyers are men. Usually with an above average or average IQ. In one sting operation, 47% of them had college educations. Beginning to change image of who buys. 85% of them prefer females, 15% prefer males. They often begin getting into this by watching porn on the computer. Scientists tell us that pornography, watching pornography is addictive. It becomes like a drug. It's not like watching a football game, which is a different kind of addiction. It becomes, it, it becomes, it, it does something in your brain, in male brains, okay? And it escalates from sort of soft porn to hardcore porn to child porn and then to buying kids. Some of these men cherish women in their lives. They love their wives. They love their daughters. They love their mothers but they don't love the ones they buy. For them, women are objects. They buy that for pleasure, not for love. And what we need to understand is that any of these Johns could be any one of us here. They could be my, my son, who's 42. They could be my minister now, because I attend another church. They could be a school teacher, a professor. They could be the person who works on your car. They could be the store clerk at Fred Meyer. There is no distinction here. So we need to get rid of all the stereotypes of who gets trafficked and of who buys traffic, who buys trafficked kids. Of the ones we know, again, I'm shooting for our end of the, of the state, of the buyers we know, 50% of them come from Multnomah County. 71% of them come from Oregon. So it's not just an out-of-town thing. 
22% of them come from Clark County, by the way, and the reason is because there's much more in, 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 in the metro area than there is in Clark County. It's much more available, so they come down. Washington has different laws. Most of them are married. Two-thirds of them have children. Changing your stereotypes, I hope. Making it a little more complicated, because it is. Now, if it's a relief to know 85% of men never buy sex. 5% buy 50% of the sex. They are really busy. Now, these are really overwhelming numbers, I think. Um, and, and I've given you, a whole, shoveled off a whole lot of numbers to give you some clue about sort of what we're dealing with. And it's, it's, it's true in Salem, too. Um, we have yet to find a city in, in Oregon that doesn't have it, and town, that doesn't, doesn't have child sex trafficking. Um, what we say to people that say, no, it doesn't exist here, is uh, you probably need to look a little harder and maybe talk to your law enforcement about it, because um, it hides. So I want to, are we ready for the video? Okay, I want to show you a video of, and there are two, it's two young women. And um, it will, think about what it was like when you were in middle school, if, if I have trouble getting back that far, or, or high school in terms of, um, of how naive we were, of how um, guileless we were, of... Um, how we were really open to romance, to belonging, to wanting to be loved by some wonderful person. Um, let's do it. This is Chosen. working with what we have and I was like what do we have and she's like your body I didn't know about sex trafficking until I was in the middle of it after a while you just kind of get used to it like everything that goes around just doesn't seem out out of ordinary to you we really believed that she was getting ready to be sold student, did everything you hoped your daughter would do. My dreams were to become a nurse. While I was in high school, I had found a waitressing job. I love school, I love being around my friends, and my science class was like my big thing. These traffickers or pimps, they pretend to be an older boyfriend. And these young girls actually fall in love with these guys and believe that this guy loves them back. He was like 24. He played football at a university. He had bought me some designer jeans and things. Go to like movies and malls, trips, stuff like that. He bought me a dress and some jewelry because like I didn't really have stuff like that. It's important for the pimp or the trafficker to separate these girls from their family and their friends. He really gave me the courage to kind of stand up to my mom. He was like, you know, just kind of keep it on the down low. One day he asks for something, and even though she doesn't want to do it, she's so worried about losing him that she will. And once he's had her do it once, he pretty much can control her from then on. He kept saying that he needed money. I was like, you know, I'll help you or whatever. I made a choice that night, but I found out that they actually had chosen me. What you saw was the trailer.
for your information, the movie I was referring to, the name was Why My Daughter. We're working with what we have, and I was like, what do we have? And she's like, your body. I didn't know about sex trafficking until I was in the middle of it. After a while, you just kind of get used to it. Like, everything that goes around just doesn't seem out, out of ordinary to you. We really believed that she was getting ready to be sold. I think the most common way we've seen these traffickers or pimps get involved in these girls' lives is they pretend to be an older boyfriend. And really, you know, again, we're talking about young girls that could be 12, 13, 14 years old, and perhaps they've never had a boyfriend. So to have this older male come into their life who's pretty charming, who's pretty charismatic, and suddenly paying attention to them like they've never had it before, offering to buy them things, offering to take them to dinner, to movies, have their hair done, their nails done, a tanning salon. This connection's made, and these young girls actually fall in love with these guys and believe that this guy loves them back. And then one day, he asks for something, and even though she doesn't want to do it, she's so worried about losing him that she will and once he's had her do it once, he pretty much can control her from then on through shame, through drugs, through threats about family or physical beatings. But the reality is it can be any girl. And we've learned that through experience, unfortunately, that girls from good homes, girls that have good grades, do all the right things, can still be exposed to this. Uh, the 17-year-old girl that I'm familiar with, her name is Brianna. And Brianna comes from a small town, was an A student, an athlete, volunteered in her community, was a cheerleader, and uh, attended college uh, while going to high school. And she came into my life through um, a phone call I received on a Saturday night. My name is Brianna, and I didn't know about sex trafficking until I was in the middle of it. I'm sure you're like me, where you think that sex trafficking wouldn't affect your life, but I'll tell you my story. I was from a small town and just really enjoyed being a part of the community. When I was in high school, I actually took college courses because I knew that I wanted to be a nurse. I was really excited about getting my education started and I knew that I could really focus myself while I was in high school to get those A's I needed in college. I was waitressing and just doing a good job. I was always really friendly and would have conversations with my customers. What I didn't realize was that one of my customers, he was gathering information about me through our innocent conversations, where I was going to school, what my family was like, you know, what I wanted to be. He was, um, he was gathering information about me to eventually use it against me. Um, I was just at work one evening and some guys came in and they were really cool. One, his name was Nick and he was like 24. He played football at, at um, a university. He was tall and blonde and he was super funny. We were just like laughing the entire time that he was having his meal. He told me that he was from Seattle, which I thought was just a coincidence. And I told him that, you know, wow, I want to live, I want to move there. And we were just flirting the whole time, and he was telling me how beautiful I am and making me feel good about myself. Um, at the end of the conversation with Nick, he gave me his phone number. And we talked for quite a bit of time. I made a choice that night, but I found out that they actually 
had chosen me. When I decided to go up and hang out with Nick in Seattle, I couldn't tell my parents because they wouldn't let me. So since he was older, I had to make a lie to get around my parents. So I told, I told them that I was going to hang out with my girlfriend for the day. When I got to Seattle, I pulled up to a gorgeous house. It was Victorian style and it had a lake view. I was blown away. I didn't realize that when I was meeting his friends, they were actually shopping me. And they were seeing if they wanted to buy me or if they knew somebody that might want to buy me. Um, so I didn't realize that his friends were, were traffickers too. And he was so smooth and, and came off so sincere and genuine. Um, when I asked him, how, how am I gonna get a job? You know, what am I gonna do? He said, you know, you could waitress, you're good at that. I saw you waitressing, you're good at that. But how much do you usually make in a night? And I told him that I usually make about $85. He told me to put a zero on that 85, and that's how much I could bring in a night with the job that he knew of. He told me that his ex-girlfriend was a dancer and that it was really easy and that, um, that I could probably do it. And for a minute, I considered dancing. I was thinking, hmm, well, probably isn't that bad. And then he said, okay, let's go to the strip club. I felt like if I didn't go to the strip club with him that he would look at me as just a child, as a kid. You know, here I am, I'm 18. I can go into a strip club at this point. And it was kind of like, if you don't, then you're not an adult. That's how I felt. This strip club was just really loud and dark. It was gross and it smelled. It didn't feel very comfortable and, you know, it's like everything has this like sticky look to it. You don't really want to touch anything because everything's got germs on it. I, I felt kind of gross that I was even in there. I was only in the club for two nights dancing, but in that time frame, a lot of guys wanted to take me home. And one guy, he offered me $1,000 for an hour, and I couldn't believe it. So me and Nick talked about going to Arizona, and we both decided that I needed to return my dad's car. On my way to return my dad's car, I was calling friends to help me move out. and get the car returned, and then get me back up to Seattle. So the only friend that offered to help was my ex-boyfriend, and his name was Evan. I was surprised that he was going to help, but we just kept a really close relationship. We were good friends still. So when I got to his house, though, he was asking me so many questions. Evan was so concerned about where did they get all this money and why aren't they working. He was asking just these questions and it, I was starting to realize that he didn't really want to help me. And then I realized that he was trying to talk me out of going to Arizona and moving out. And so I, I wanted to go, I wanted to leave. So on my way of walking out of Evan's door, he, um, his parents were there. I felt like Evan betrayed me because he called his parents and my parents to try to help convince me not to go to Arizona and not to move out. And, you know, here I am, given all these opportunities to go to school in Seattle, I felt like it was a dream come true. I was going to Arizona for winter break and they all didn't see it. 
I felt like my family and Evan, they wanted to keep me just in this little bubble and that I'm just a child and I don't really know what I'm doing. So I was upset. I was really mad at Evan. I felt like he completely was ruining our friendship. He had lost my trust. And a woman walked into the room and introduced herself. Her name was Linda Smith, and she was a specialist in getting girls to recognize and flee from human trafficking. After a long conversation with that I was being groomed for trafficking, that I was in the middle of the process, and that it was almost too late. I was the good guy, and Evan was the bad guy. But now I realize he saved my life. Nick was grooming me to be trafficked. I started getting angry and upset. Linda from all the stories that she was telling me. She told me one about a 13-year-old girl who was tricked on the night of her birthday. Monday through Friday, like never wanted to miss school. I love school, I love being around my friends and my science class was like my big thing. We were walking down the street, coming back from the little corner store, and there was these white guys out there, like, saying, yeah, there's a party. You guys should really come, and you guys would have fun. We were like, okay, well, we're going into eighth grade. We might as well get our first party out. You know, like, let's just go have fun. It was just, like, a quiet neighborhood. And so we were like, you know, it's cool. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? So we were like, yeah, this is... This is harmless. It's like one of those ones you see in a movie. Like, it, it was fun. And I was sitting on the couch just listening to music. My friends were off dancing and stuff. And some really cute guy comes up and starts talking to me. And I'm like, you know, just like sitting there. Like, he was really persistent on like talking to me and trying to get to know me. He was like 20, 23 or something, something like that. I was at Starbucks ordering a drink and he had said, you know, hey, do you remember me? And I was like, nope, sorry, nope, don't remember you. And he's like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure I remember you. You know, I was like, okay, whatever. So I gave him my number, and we talked for a little bit and hang out. And we'd go to, like, movies and malls, trips and stuff like that. And it was pretty cool. Like, I'd never had a boyfriend before. So it was, like, cool. Like, he bought me a dress, and it was, like, just, like, really special to me. It was like I felt like I was, like, a princess, like a queen or something and he used to call me his queen. You know, I started thinking, you know, he really did like me and listening to all the dreams he was like trying to sell. He wants to marry me and stuff like that. And he can't wait for us to move in together and have a life. He kept saying that he needed money and he was going to lose his cars and his house and stuff and he's not going to have anywhere to go. So I was like, you know, I'll help you, whatever. And so we went to the strip club. And like, it was just like super uncomfortable. So I went out of the room and he started yelling at me like, and I was like, I'm not doing that. I want to go home. And he wouldn't let me go home till my shift was over. I was 13 when I started in the strip clubs. I signed up for track, and during track, like, I'd just kind of not go, and I'd go spend them with him or whatever. And then I started going to strip clubs for him, and what I'd do is, I, um, we'd go to school on the bus, and then right when I got off the bus, I'd just kind of leave and go meet him down the street or something. And then just as the buses were pulling up, I'd be back on the bus, so it was like I went to school. And I'd leave for the, like weekends saying, I'm at my friend's house, and like whenever my mom would call on my friend's phone, we'd just freeway call it so it sounded like we were together. 
because, you know, my friends would cover for me. I was on the phone with him and he was like cussing me out, saying, you know, he didn't know why I even bothered with school, I wasn't going to be anything, because that's who I am. And like, I hung up the phone and I like kind of dropped a couple tears. And I had this friend, Jordan, and she was like, you know, why would you believe somebody saying that they love you when they treat you And I really didn't have an answer for that back then. He loves me, that's all I could really think in my head. And that night, my first night, I got in the car with three people. They were all like in their 40s and 50s, maybe older. Like, I don't know, I puked for about 30 minutes. Most of like my tricks and stuff were kind of old. I was scared, I was nervous. I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't come back without any money. He's kind of a, a very physical kind of person. He, um, like, you mess up something, he'll slap you, or you know, depending on what you did, he'll like, choke you out. They were threatening to go get her 10-year-old sister. They were threatening to go beat up her family. And they had taken video of Lacey being raped the first night and threatened that they were gonna use video of her having sex with other men to show to her youth group and to show to her school. She wouldn't have felt like she belonged anywhere. She didn't feel like she belonged with her pimp, but she wasn't safe going home. I just didn't know about trafficking and that there were older men preying on teenagers to bring them to a market, to sell them. Traffickers go anywhere that there's a large group of girls or that girls frequent, like the mall or Starbucks. They'll go to arcades, anywhere that teenagers like to hang out at, parks, restaurants. Signs that you can watch out for for your friends would be small tattoos or tattoo of a name. Maybe your friend has an older boyfriend that she's trying to keep a secret or she has new clothes that are really expensive, like a $300 purse or a really nice jacket. If your friend asks you to cover for her, don't do it. You're not doing her a favor. You could be helping her destroy her own life. And just like her, you don't know that what she's doing is so dangerous, but you'll never see her again. So what can we do to fight sex trafficking? I think the most important thing that we can do is get the word out. The only way to protect girls from sex trafficking is to be educated on what sex trafficking looks like. If you can't recognize the signs, you're not gonna save your friend. I think Evan was a true defender of Brianna. You know, he took a chance, he stepped out, he told the truth, he told what was going on with her. He violated her trust in the interest of protecting her. And I think that's a good lesson for us. Had he not done that, we might not have Brianna here with us today. I think what's important to understand is that these pimps have studied, preyed upon, stalked these girls. They do know where they live. They do know about their family. And when they threaten these girls, these girls don't feel safe. They don't feel that they have the ability to return home. And that was one of the questions we used to struggle with is, if this girl was doing something she didn't want to do, why wouldn't she just leave? And the fact is they can't see their way out of it. They, they don't see a safe way out of it. I would want to make sure that you understand where these guys are at. They're at your malls. They're at your stores. They're at places where kids congregate. Really, probably the biggest key is these older boyfriends. You heard Brianna talking about it. An older, mid-20s male has no business uh, being around 13, 14-year-old girls, or even up to 18-year-old girls. So protect your friends. When we look back at Lacey's friends who really could have intervened at different points in her life and didn't, She's never seen those friends again. So 
The fact they thought maybe they were protecting her at the time really never helped her, and they've never been around in her life since. Take a breath. Dana and I have had conversations with Brianna. She's finished nursing school in Seattle and she's a practicing nurse. And uh, my goodness, was she lucky to have an ex-boyfriend like that. Lacey um, got moved to Florida for her own protection by Shared Hope. and. Um, we understand that she's now back in the area, but we don't have any more information than that about her. Um, I could talk a little bit about, about pimps, about the traffickers. Um, it's, it, it, I love freedom of information and I hate it. Um, I could go online this afternoon and find handbooks on how to become a trafficker and learn how to do it. They are enormously, many of them are enormously skilled at brainwashing, at knowing, so that they can walk through a group of kids, of teenagers, and actually say, not that one, not that one, that one. And just by looking in appearance. At, at how they are relating to their environment, you can learn how to do that. Um, the reason why we don't use the word pimp is because a few years back uh, there was a, actually a Grammy Award um, given to a song about pimping. And so it's become a popular thing and so we, we use the word trafficker. And we need to understand that there's no, there's no um, stereotype for who a trafficker might be just like there's no stereotype for who might be trafficked. Um, it could be most anybody, um, male, female, any race. Um, and remember, it's all about money. It's only about money. The guess is that in Portland, annually, it's somewhere around $80 million worth of money. That's as much or more than um, Powell's Bookstore makes in a year. I mean, we're talking about a lot of money. Um, it, and it's only about money. Um, they, they talked, the, the, the film talked about um, older, older boyfriend. Um, that's one way. Um, it sort of becomes kind of a courtship. A, another way is um, advertising for becoming a model, going to a modeling agency. Okay? You are gorgeous. You are spectacular. Oh, we've got to see about this for you. Um, 
the, probably the most vulnerable, if, if you have to do kind of a group sort of an ass assessment, probably the most vulnerable group in our nation are foster kids. Why? Simple. They're looking for their forever home. And so if some man or woman starts paying them attention, starts giving them affection and love and security, they're going to fall for that potentially because they don't have it. They don't know where they're going to be next year or next month in their foster care. This guy really loves me and really pays attention. Um, and uh, so they're, they, they're one of the, the most vulnerable groups. Um, again, it doesn't matter socioeconomic level. A few years back, um, there, were, there were articles about um, an ex, a former cheerleader at Lake Oswego High School. We're talking about Lake Oswego High School now. Um, and, and you all understand what I, what I meant by that. It's fairly wealthy income. Um, and, and she was recruiting other, her friends who were cheerleaders at Lake Oswego High School to do that. Okay. Again, it, it, we'd like to sort of pigeonhole it, and it's only these people, and only it's not. It, um, it could be most anywhere. Um, Dana, do I need to hit anything else at the moment? Okay, let's do a little bit of question and answer. If you still have some questions or have any questions or answers, or if you're just sort of numb, that's okay too. Because yeah, I understand why I ha why it's hard for me to talk about. We might want to wait till after the break because it's uh, it's break time basically. So okay. could we do the questions after that? Sure, we can do the questions after the break. We're also going to put some material on the tables and chairs for you to have um, during the break so that you can um, have some of this in writing instead of just having to memorize some of it. Okay, and we'll have it on the back table too. Okay, let's try for some questions for a few minutes anyway. Okay, it's my turn, I guess. Maybe not. Okay, my question is, there are all these traffickers out there. Now, we had one grand case of a trafficker who they threw the book at. We've got to know who some of them are. What happens to them, and how does the justice system work for the traffickers? Not being a lawyer, um, I, I can't answer it from that side, but I can give you a clue. Um, some time back, um, Dana and I were in a meeting, and, and we um, heard the story of a woman who had been trafficked for some time. And she was now, she had now, she got out of it, and um, she had started her own business um, helping people who were getting out of being trafficked, okay? And somebody said, what about your trafficker? Is he in jail? And she said, no, he's still trafficking. And they said, why? And she said, because I am unwilling to testify against him because he told me he will kill my children, and he will. That is, we can't put a person in jail until a trafficked person, a victim, is willing to testify. And think about being 15 or 14 and having been beaten up by this person at the same time he's telling you that he loves you so much and needs you so much and therefore you better shape up. And everything, including every stitch of clothing that you wear has been bought by him and you have no place to go. And he tells you that the police are your enemies and your family has disowned you because they can't stand the thought of a prostitute in their family. Is that kid going to turn himself in? And is she going to then sit in court with other traffickers watching and sit there and be able to have the courage to testify? Probably not. And that's why they're still out there. OK, right here, Irene. Um so you said, of course, that most men don't do this. It's a small percent. And even of the small percent, it's really small, the really bad ones. So there was an article in the New York Times about colleges and how 
most boys or young men in college don't do this, but there's a very small percent that absolutely do and are total predators. And most of the rapes or problems on the college are committed by that very small group. So um, what, how does, how, even what you just said makes it really hard, but how does that be eliminated? How do people identify these predators that are really not the biggest part of humanity? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really don't know. But, but that is a wonderful segue into another piece that I do know. I love talking to groups where there are men because a whole lot of the problem has to do with how we raise our sons and grandsons in this country. It has to do with how we talk about and teach relationships and whether it's really okay for men to go out and sow their wild oats while they're in college or college age and get what they can on their date and all that kind of stuff. What are we teaching them about valuing every human being, including women, in terms of relationships? And what does the media teach about that? I mean, it really, for me, a whole lot of it is up to men to teach their sons and grandsons. This is where we all can participate, by the way. Um, what, are we, what are our grandchildren learning about how we value each other and how we honor each other's integrity and not violate it because that's not how we want to be treated and we don't think that we should be able to do that to anybody else, even though maybe some of our friends are. Um, anyway, that, I, I think we have a job to do as, as males in our society. Hi. Back here. Yeah. Um, just tagging on to that real quick. This recent 60 Minutes thing shows that exactly what you're talking about. They wanted to let the boy off because he was, a, yeah, okay. Anyway, my question is actually, a few years ago I read, and I don't know if it's still true, that I think it was Sweden was making it legal to be, that prostitution was going to be legal in order to stop this pimping. And I'm wondering if you know anything about that, if it worked, and you also mentioned that Washington's law was different does there, what is their law and does it help? Okay, the first part is the answer I, I don't know for Sweden. I, I have no information. Um, I was just asked that in the break about, about how come they come from Clark County down. Um, my under, again, remember I'm not a lawyer. My understanding is that the issue in Oregon is our First Amendment. That in our Constitution, our First Amendment is stronger than the nation's First Amendment in terms of protecting rights of expression, okay? Washington's is tighter. So for example, the metro area has more strip clubs per capita, per capita, not total number, per capita, than any other city in the country. Because our First Amendment protects them from being regulated harder, unlike Washington, which can regulate harder and therefore there's less availability. Is that right, Dana, did I get that right? Yeah. More, yeah, yeah, we have more per capita than Las Vegas. I mean, think about that. San Francisco. My question is kind of a segue from that. Um, speaking of strip clubs, it sounds like one of the, the one of the the younger girl was forced to perform at a strip club. Don't aren't they rated occasionally for uh, minors being exploited and? You know, what, what's the police doing about that? You might ask what the Salem police are doing about that. And I, I, I'm really serious about that. Um, part, of, part of where you can go next is to talk to your law enforcement ab about, do they have a special unit that's dealing with victims? Remember, we don't call them prostitutes. We call them victims because they are. They're trapped. And, and, and how is it being used in, in the Salem Polk County area? Um, I, I honestly don't know how it is, but that would be where I would go to say, what do you do? And do, are you raiding the, the strip clubs that are here in Salem? Um, occasionally they get raided in Portland. Um, our unit has way too many things to do. And, and so that doesn't happen too often. Um, but last January we were doing a, a, a march and on, on 82nd Avenue, good old 82nd Avenue, with signs and stuff at, at dinner time. It was dark, so we had signs with lights and everything about, yeah, children are not, our children are not for sale, um, that kind of sign. 
and we were walking down, and we happened to stop at this sleazy looking little building right on the sidewalk, and I didn't even know it was there, and it had Christmas, you know, white lights around it and all this sort of stuff, and we just stopped. And this woman came flying out the door onto the little porch and started swearing at us about getting off of her property. And there are no miners here. There are no, well, it was a massage parlor, <laughs> which I've driven by and never seen. Yeah. It was a massage. And she was really adamant. There are no miners. There are no miners here. Okay. Another question? Yeah. yeah. Do we know what the trends are? Is the problem getting worse? It's just we know more about it. What's... Oh, excellent. So she can to some of okay, so, so Esther, Esther's going to come up in a second and, and respond to that, um, and maybe she can help you, okay, with, with that question, like, is, is it getting better or is it getting worse? The thing I can tell you is it's getting more known. When we started this seven years ago, people refused to even hear us. The brochures that you have, little brochures that are on the table back there, people wouldn't even take them. They didn't want to deal with them, and, and, and we could not hand them out. I mean, they were in denial with children, and now they'll take them. They know it's an issue, okay? Thanks, Jim, and thank you for inviting us to come and share this with you. I know it's a difficult topic, but it really needs to be discussed, and the more we're talking about it, the more we can make our grandchildren and children around us aware of the hazards and how they could inadvertently get pulled into trafficking. I'd like to introduce the next speaker. We wanted to have someone that represented your geographical area talking about what she does and, and what is going on. Um, she's been a crime victim's advocate for 15 years. She serves sexual assault, domestic violence, sex trafficking survivors. Esther founded Safety Compass, an Oregon-based nonprofit that offers advocacy services for commercially sexually exploitation and trafficking survivors. Esther is currently the CEO of Safety Compass, which was the recipient of the 2017 FBI Director Community Leadership Award and is recognized for her advocacy service by the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force, and the Portland Police Bureau, and the Nevada State Victims' Rights Alliance. Esther has trained approximately 21,500 people on topics of sexual assault, sex training, suicide intervention, crisis intervention, and collaborative practices between advocates and law enforcement. Esther provides expert witness testimony on trafficking dynamics and victimology upon request. She is a wealth of information, and I'm sure that you'll enjoy her presentation. Please welcome Esther. Thank you, Dana, um, and thank you all for being here, uh, and thank you, Pastor, for sharing. I, the statistics are um, mind-boggling, so I appreciate you sitting through that and the weight that you carry just listening to all those numbers. Um, what I want to spend my time talking to you about are the dynamics and how they relate locally. Um, I work at Safety Compass, which is a regional advocacy uh, nonprofit, and we partner with the police, child welfare, emergency rooms, and juvenile justice centers to respond 24 hours a day to do advocacy work for survivors who are found by those environments. So usually we're on scene um, with patrol or in the ER. Uh, we're embedded in their stings when they do do a club raid, things like that. So we see the dynamics in the region. Uh, we cover Washington, Multnomah, Clackamas, and Marion County. So kind of a broad bird's eye view, but a lot of the dynamics we see here in Salem are very similar to what we see in Portland. Um, you know, what we see in Happy Valley is not that different than Hillsborough. So I'll focus locally, but if you have other questions um, outside of, you know, Salem proper, that's okay. And I took down the questions that were being asked, and I'm hoping that I can get to them by the end if I talk super fast. So with that, I'm going to just jump right in. So um, you heard some stats about the fact that trafficking is such a lucrative business. It's the most lucrative economy in the world, and because of that, organized crime stands to gain more by selling sex than any other um, form of sale. So more than arms dealing um, globally and more than drug dealing. 
Um, there are federal and local laws that do um, help us prosecute uh, and charge traffickers um, and buyers, but we focus more on traffickers just in terms of if we have to pick some area of enforcement, we focus on the higher lethality end of the demographic. So, um, but there are federal and state laws, uh, and hopefully we can get back to that because I can um, talk to you about some local cases that might be um, interesting. So we already heard about the statistics. They do ring true locally. Actually, the 469 victims that um, were referenced earlier out of the Portland area actually came from my caseload. I pulled every one of those numbers myself, so I know them by heart, um, when I worked in the Portland metro area supervising the SARC unit up there, which was the sexual assault response um, team unit in Portland before. So, um, But now I work um, farther south. Um, a little bit about the local work that we do here in the Salem area. Obviously, it was mentioned earlier that the I-5 corridor is a major area of concern, and that's very true. Um, really, any neighboring um, county to uh, the I-5 corridor is of, I would see, uh, increased vulnerability compared to much of the rest of the western United States. But this is um, a map of all, it's pretty small, so I'll get over there and I'll reference it um, for people in the back. But this is a map of all the major organized crime thoroughfares in the country. And bear with me, <laughs> I've lost my mic. This is I-5 right here. So this right here, this looks kind of like a banana, is the western circuit, is what we call it. There's a western circuit an eastern circuit, a southern belt circuit, and a midwest circuit. And we're on the most major thoroughfare of the west coast circuit. The movement that we see on the west coast circuit moves from Seattle through um, out Oregon, down into LA, um, sometimes as far south as into um, Central and Southern America. But then most often when it's um, domestic and not international, it kind of moves over th from LA to Las Vegas, sometimes up to Phoenix and back. So a lot of movement on the west coast, um, and that also mirrors other kinds of gang activity. Um, if you have uh, folks that we're working with, if we do safety plans with them, with victims, and then they talk about having to be um, moved around the country and they're actually moved from one circuit to another, that's a different level of organized crime and it really changes our safety plan. So I'm, I think of everything through the advocate lens in working with the victims and helping them get safe, but um, the movement um, definitely mirrors all, all forms of organized crime, not just the movement of people. Um, sorry, my words are so dark. I didn't think about how red would show up in this room. Um, the major stages of their experiences, and this rings true locally, but also I would say pretty much exactly the same all over the country, um, is the recruitment and grooming stage, and that's what you saw focused on in the movie. And then there's this breaking stage, and that's where those girls were f um, put up on the stage to be dancers and then pushed into the sex industry. And then there's the maintenance stage, which is just where they're controlled because of fear in the industry. And we typically see people in our work after a breaking stage or into sort of the maintenance stage. At the recruitment and grooming stage, when kids are vulnerable, they usually don't know that they're being groomed. So it's very hard to do an intervention. Um, you heard about the grooming tactics that are most often used. Um, I think that was already covered pretty well. The number one tactic is the boyfriend tactic, which you heard about. Um, modeling would come second. Um, having a recording contract would be third, um, the pornography business being the fourth, and general gang connection and gang um, control being the sort of fifth and sixth sort of runners in that um, sort of statistical race for what the angles are for grooming tactics. Um, but why kids get involved is simply this idea of associating with this person, um, this, even if they know that they have a criminal record, for example, is that it's gonna equal some sort of better life for them than they had before, help them get out of poverty. And the stories that you hear are absolutely heartbreaking. Um, the, the kids um, who are being groomed are really running up against things like, well, I've never had a family, so you say that you love me. I've literally never experienced that before, so okay, right? Or I'm trying to help my mom pay for dialysis and she'll die if I don't turn tricks because how else am I gonna make money at 14? So really, really hard stories and very compelling reasons why kids are vulnerable to get pulled into the industry. Um, obviously, we don't have to spend much time on the abuse because that's the hard stuff and you've already heard about that today, but all the people I work with are sexual assault, domestic, and child abuse survivors at the same time. 
um, in one place at one time. So it's the most complex abuse of all the kind of cases I've ever worked um, and the longest healing trajectory, but I'm an undyingly hopeful person and I hope to reframe this for hopefully for the rest of our time together today to say that because of that, I can definitely stand here and tell you I absolutely have an unquenchable belief in uh, the resiliency of the human spirit. <laughs> um, the people I work with are absolutely incredible survivalists and their healing process is possible and I see it every day and you wouldn't even know that this is the reality of their life. Uh, the last slide, um, because so many of them are overcoming in ways that just, they mask that so well. So um, that's the hopeful stuff that I get to see every day. And I feel like I have the best job in the world because of that. Um, in terms of venues, there are about seven major subcultures operating in the Salem area. Um, strip clubs, escort sites, um, dance clubs that are kind of fronts. Uh, they come across as nightclubs, but they're really brothels. Um, houses that are acting as brothels. Um, field camps being recruited, uh, recruitment areas for pimps to go find, find folks in. Uh, video poker uh, rooms in bars. That's a big um, venue point in rural areas where they don't have what we call like a track, is an urban area, uh, a place where buyers go to buy and pimps go to put girls out for sale. In Portland, you might have heard of 82nd Avenue, which is the biggest track in, in Oregon. Um, Salem has multiple tracks, which we'll talk about, but um, in rural areas, they don't have that, right? Because there's not one major um, focal point, like no major road, and so they'll use the video poker rooms as exchange points. Casinos, um, tracks are those roads like 82nd, uh, truck stops, which Marion County definitely has, and they are uh, fronts for or areas for for trafficking. Um, city parks have their own hierarchy of who has like a turf. Um, different gangs will have different turf in parks, and they're used to traffic people. Um, porn production sites, and then obviously the internet. Um, on the internet, used to be that Backpage was the biggest um, sale point. Backpage was a do you remember when, well, Craigslist is still somewhat popular, but you're probably familiar with Craigslist, which you can use to like buy a used couch. <laughs> um, Craigslist was used to sell people, but they had a lot of enforcement activity there, and so all of that um, exploitation activity moved to Backpage. Backpage was seized about a year and a half ago by the federal government, and then the sex industry just splintered into a million different little sites to figure out who's gonna be the next front runner. Um, unfortunately, all of the IP addresses are, are now overseas, so we can't enforce, we can't um, subpoena material out of them. So it's become a lot harder, and a lot of the uh, exchange points move to sugar daddy sites uh, to recruit girls who think that they're going there to actually date people, like legitimately date people, and then into our dating websites. So dating websites, are still legit, like I'm not trying to scare people away from their use, but there's a lot of sex industry activity in them, so it's hard to discern if you're talking to real people or not for sort of real dates. Um, in terms of a, sort of a hierarchy of venues, and hierarchy is all about money, you heard that before, it's all about where the money is in your community. Um, locally, I would say our porn production sites, the houses that act as brothels, um, escorting like will come across not as something illicit, it'll come across, or Ill illegal, it'll come across as like a lingerie modeling venue or dancing and strip clubs. Those are probably our most lucrative venues locally with um, tracks, uh, motels that are doing what we call in-call and out-call work where girls are bought, brought in or um, they're staying and they're sort of leaving, taking like Ubers or their pimps are driving them out to meet with um, buyers. Um, the video poker rooms, our truck stop here in Marion County, um, those are probably our next biggest venues um, and certainly where our gang related activity is happening. And then our parks, which we definitely have some very involved parks here locally, um, are operating with probably the least amount of money. But that's your hierarchy for the local area. Um, we see multiple gang sets running all of the really all of the trafficking in this county. Um, and I was just thinking off the top of my head, um, we've got Silverton Road, Market Street, Mission Street, um, and Portland Road being our biggest tracks in Salem. Uh, we also have a lot of um, what we call flop activity in Dallas, Oregon, which is in Polk County, but it's still close by, where gang members that do their crimes here in Salem 
they actually will, will go and live in Dallas because it's a little off the grid for local law enforcement. So those are some of the local stats I can tell you about. Other things I was thinking about are, um, we've seen a huge surge in reflexology and massage parlors, which is um, very, that is the most organized kind of crime we have in the local area for trafficking. That's um, all run overseas. Uh, it's run by, well, I won't even tell you who it's run by because <laughs> there are many different gang sets of all different um, socioeconomic sort of angles and um, race and ethnicity groups. So I don't want to focus on one to make it seem like one demographic is more involved than another because it's really um, rampant in every subculture. But um, the local reflexology and massage parlors are the most organized kind of crime we've got going on locally. Um, so that's a little bit about the local demographics. Um, we've already talked about the trauma. Um, to talk to, to you a little bit about um, our involvement as we intervene with people, um, almost 100% of them have Stockholm Syndrome or at least display Stockholm Syndrome-like behaviors. And if you're familiar with Stockholm Syndrome, it's um, a bonding that happens between a person, an abusive person in power and a person that's being controlled by them. It actually, the term was coined in a bank heist in Stockholm, Sweden, where some bank robbers um, took control of 12 hostages that ended up feeling like they had befriended them to the point that when they were saved by the police, they opened a legal defense fund for the bank robbers. And so therefore, many studies were um, conducted about why that would be. And what they found is that when you are controlled by someone who has the ability to end your life, but they don't, your brain has flipped the narrative on its head to survive in the most palatable way possible. And that is, oh, um, this is super scary, and I can't change anything around me, but I can change my thoughts about it. And if I just decide we're friends and befriend this person, um, it's a lot less scary. And that, in a very small nutshell, is what happens between trafficked youth and their traffickers. And so when we intervene, not only are we flying in the face of that coping skill, um, but it's sort of shattering the narrative that they've built about this person. So it's a difficult intervention. And that's why I spend most of my time talking to ER nurses and law enforcement about how to even do that intervention. Um, but we have some red flags you can look for in your own life with youth that you know. Um, where am I at for time? I have like no watch. Great. OK, good. Um, the red flags are um, if, a full, if a young person has more than one cell phone anymore, there's all these phone apps. And so I used to always say, if they have one more than one cell phone, that's fishy to me. But if they have one phone that has multiple cell phone apps with different phone numbers kind of coming in, that's a big red, uh, red flag to me. Because what will happen is they'll be posted online, which is usually how people are exploited, is that they're posted online for sale. And on different venues, they'll have different phone numbers associated with their posts. So as buyers call them to purchase them, they'll know, oh, that's, that number's associated with that platform. Um, that's you know on seeking arrangements and that phone number is associated with you know skip the games or whatever venue they've been uh, posted on and it helps them organize who's calling them from where how much money can i make on that venue it just helps them organize um, the exploitation so um, that's a red flag to me um, others are when they have social media accounts with aliases when when parents call us and say our kids run away we don't know where they are the very first thing i ask for is their social media because I know they've got a Square account, is what they call it. That's their account that they're like friends with their mom on and their grandma. Uh, they talk to their teachers on. But then they have another account with an alias, and that's the beginning of the rabbit trail into their life in the industry. And that's where they're talking to their regular buyers. Um, they're put up for sale by their pimp. And so if I can find their alias page, I can usually figure out where they are, what handles there are associated on their Instagram feed. And so this might be like social media land long, long, long over your head. It is over my head, to be completely honest. But um, if that's my rabbit trail to figuring out usually where they are. Um, if they've got a tire that doesn't match the weather or season, that could be pretty subjective. But when it starts to kind of line up with a bunch of other red flags, then I really start to notice. Like, why are you, you know, being picked up on the side of the road at 1 o'clock in the morning wearing high heels and almost no clothes when it's 30 degrees outside, right? Like, that doesn't make sense. Um, for kids who run away from home, you heard some pretty staggering statistics earlier about 
this the vulnerability of running away and the youth that I end up working with, you know, they I look at their histories when they when we pull their DHS reports and it's like, you know, running away like 14, 28 times. Like how is that kid not being trafficked at that point statistically speaking that's basically impossible. So looking at running away is a huge vulnerability factor. Um, if they are getting their nails done, maybe a fake weave in their hair, they're wearing expensive clothing, again, it's just putting pieces together. You know, If you're 14, you can't legally have a job in the state of Oregon, so how is it that that all costs you $600, right? Because those things are expensive. So just um, paying attention to that. Um, if they have that new boyfriend, which has been a theme today, um, that coincides with these changes in their life of attire or money showing up, um, if they're flashing gang signs or gang-related tattoos, um, if they've come home from being gone and now they've got cash or hotel room keys um, or condoms, things like that, and then if they use sex industry-specific language, which most people don't know, um, I probably unfortunately have just in my brain, but we actually have dictionaries that we use to sort of decipher people's code language on their social media accounts. Um, and that's another way that it helps me determine sort of what's going on in social media land, uh, which is the most telling environment. Um, usually people will tag, if you know what tagging is, where you tag your maybe your friend or your mom in a picture, they'll tag their pimp and they'll call him like king or daddy, and then they'll they'll uh, tag their like sister wives, sisters in law, wifeys, and then girls' names, and those are all the girls in their stable, which is the girls that this one pimp exploits. So I can usually look at their social media and figure out pretty much the picture of what's going on in their subculture. Uh, which helps me know how to intervene, maybe who their pimp's connected to. Um, their pimps are about making more money, right? So they don't want to hide. They want to promote. So amazingly, if you can find the pimp's social media account, they've got their own YouTube channel where they're talking about pimping. They're recruiting other people. You know, they have, like, running YouTube channels by pimps for pimps that are closed and you can, like, subscribe to, and then you can learn how to be one. So it's really, that's demoralizing, but um, there's just a lot of information out there and it's not hidden, right? Because they want to make money so they can't hide. Um, locally, I want to get into like what you do if you actually find someone or you think you have. Locally, you can call Safety Compass uh, because we cover this region, but certainly if you're not coming from this area, that's our 24-hour call-out number. Um, at the top there, but if you're, and we've also got a website, safetycompass.org, but if you're not from this area and you actually wanted to call um, and get some help, there's the National Human Trafficking Hotline, um, and they cover the entire country, and after talking to um, a person on the, their sort of call center, they will route you back to your local area. Um, so the reason I even gave you our information is that if you call locally, they will refer you back to us. So it's just faster. But, um, but certainly if you're calling from outside the area, the National Human Trafficking Hotline is phenomenal. You can ask um, questions about, like, um, based on who you see or what you think the situation is. They'll either refer you back to law enforcement, medical care. If you actually have someone that you're, you know, close to that's been exploited, they'll say, you know, we can get them connected to housing advocacy, mental health, just depending on their needs. So it's a really, really great service. And they also do, sorry, that's dark. It's nationalhumantraffickinghotline.org. They do live chat. So what we find is that many youth are much more comfortable chatting with texting or like live chatting on a, like a message machine as opposed to calling. That is so old school to them. <laughs> so, but if they can live chat, they're good to go. So um, the great thing about the hotline is that they have a live chat capability 24 hours a day. So there are some options out there for support. Um, I think I'll go back to some of the questions you had because they were great. But I think um, I would encourage you that every single person knows children, right? And kids' vulnerability factors as they enter early adolescence are huge, and not just for trafficking, right? It's like many things are going on in their, their lives as they get older. And having safe adults in their life reduces their risk in all kinds of ways, right? Not just for trafficking, for sexual abuse, for um, domestic violence and teen dating violence as they get older, um, for neglect if things are hard at home. So being a safe adult 
can help kids in all kinds of ways, and we all have that power, even if you can't you know, join a task force or, or get embedded in a sting tomorrow, <laughs> right? So I really encourage you there that if you leave here and you want to do something, you really can. And you may never know the seeds you plant and what its impact is, um, but I really believe that planting seeds is the way to start. And statistics would show that a kid who has one safe adult in their life, even if they are living in an abusive home and they can't leave and they continue to experience abuse, if they have one safe adult in their life, the way that that can increase their healing trajectory, decrease suicidal ideation, um, decrease chances of post-traumatic stress disorder is huge. So just um, be encouraged about your own capability in kids' lives. Um, last thing I wanna go over, um, or. Is it okay if I answer some of those questions? Okay, great. <laughs> I just want to give you time. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, questions that were asked so far that were awesome. Um, what is the justice system doing about the traffickers? Um, our prosecution increases since I've been an advocate in the Portland metro area and so south of that have been 200% or more in all the jurisdictions that we are involved in. So I've seen huge leaps and bounds there, which is super encouraging. Um, even starting doing work in this county um, four years ago, this is kind of the newest county of our involvement. Um, when we came along, they were like, have we ever prosecuted a trafficker? I think so. <laughs> I think maybe one or two. Um, and now we're looking at that, those things happening regularly. So I, I would say that that's really encouraging. Um, we do know the profiles on those traffickers because they've been prosecuted. So we know their names, they're on supervision, we know where they're living. Um, are they reoffending? Sometimes yes, right? They're actually usually supervised by the psychopathy unit or the sex offender unit. Um, so they are getting supervision about reoffending and whether or not they're likely or less likely to offend. So there is some management going on there. Um, other ways that we are involved in trying to be more cutting edge, it used to be that we really couldn't even have a case if a victim wasn't willing to testify, and all of them are experiencing witness uh, tampering when they do take a case forward. They're all afraid for their life for good reason. Um, they're always um, being told things like, we're gonna kill you or kill your family or kill your children or your pets. Um, we actually have had people murdered while they were attempting to testify. So um, it is an extremely dangerous thing. Um, but I would say because of that, we worked really hard and I would say Oregon is I, I, I can't quantify this exactly, but I want to bet that we're probably leading the entire country on developing new methods that help us towards prosecution without the testimony of victims. If we can get a grand jury statement, which is a, it's, they don't ever, they're never exposed to the trafficker in a grand jury, um, we can take that statement and then we can put expert uh, witness testimony on the stand instead, and usually that's enough to get the trafficker to plead out. Um, so far, because um, I, so, I provide expert witness testimony among a few other people in the state, I've never uh, so far had a case go forward and not plead out. So we're really thankful for that. Uh, the prosecutors in the state saying we're just not going to stand by and watch victims' lives be threatened like this and just say that we'll just throw, throw up our hands, right? We have to find other ways to prosecute that don't put victims' lives at risk. So um, really thankful for the prosecutors in this state. Um, what else? How do we ID and eliminate? Um, sex offenders, I think, is actually what that um, was focusing on. Um, I think prevention came up, and so I'm not going to spend much time there. I would say primary prevention that's focused on males is awesome, and just um, supporting and loving on men in terms of what does it mean to be a man and not use power and control, right, to gain you know, uh, steam, like it just break down those sort of cultural um, themes that, that sort of um, raise people that way. And because we know that like the CDC would say if we decrease entitlement of just some men, right, um, and we increase the, the value of women, we would see sexual assaults um, drastically decrease. But we also know it's a very small percentage, right? There's all these great men who aren't doing harm, <laughs> really. So we, it's really just focusing on um, breaking down uh, the repeated behaviors of a few, which we really can do that, right? That's a doable thing. So um, the Swedish model, I think, was brought up. Um, these are terms now that are thrown all over the country, the Swedish model versus the Norway model. 
One decreases, uh, or excuse me, decriminalizes all um, prostitution-related behavior. And then one says, well, you can't buy sex because that would fuel the demand. And you can't pimp people out. But if you are being sold, that's not against, um, that's fine, right? Because um, that just means you're probably experiencing poverty. So the Norway model says you can be a person, like a female who's for sale, right? You're not gonna get in trouble for prostitution. But if you're a buyer or you're a pimp, then they've actually increased their penalties and that's worked very well because they're not criminalizing people for their own vulnerability or their own poverty, but they are criminalizing people for buying and exploiting. And that so far, in terms of decreasing just rates across the board, that model seems to be the most effective that we've seen in the country. And I would say that is controversial, but that is my opinion as well. <laughs> um, club raids locally. I've only got two more questions here and we can open it up or I can hand it over to Dana. Some people asked about club raids. Um, there have been some pretty high profile ones in this area in the last few years. I would say I support club raids. Do they actually end business activity? No. But do they make those um, enterprises afraid enough that they may change their behaviors? Yes, at least for a period of time. Um, there's an activity that happens, it's a federal initiative put on the, by the FBI, um, and they will do a couple stings a year. It's always like, you know, an undisclosed date, and we get together and we'll, we'll be involved in these stings, um, usually across the country all at the same time, so it's um, organized. Um, we've had a couple of those um, operations that did happen locally um, in the Salem area, and they did render some youth and multiple adult trafficking victims um, both times we were involved. Um, there was also a very large um, Chinese trafficking ring that was um, just recently in the last year. They did a major na international actually sting on and they did have some counterparts here in the Salem area. So we've done some club raids that were very, I think, pretty effective in this area, but we could do more and that does actually involve you going to your police chiefs and going to your legislators and talking to your city council people and county commissioners and saying, we don't want to stand for this in our county. Um, can you do something about this? And if you're not sure where to begin, you know, talk to your local law enforcement and support them and their work because they are strapped. Uh, this county is low on law enforcement bodies and they're doing a lot of really great hard work, but they could use the resources. <laughs> um, and last but not least, is it getting better or worse? Very good question. Complex answer. Um, Unfortunately, the internet expanded and exploded child pornography unlike any crime wildflower. Like, like, like it was like taking gasoline and like throwing it like a match on it and then just watching it like consume the world. So um, what was isolated child pornography um, at creation and ch um, child abuse became so rampant and the people that were watching it who wanted to consume it sort of grew in number. Um, that, to be completely honest, is something that has grown in my lifetime far beyond anything that we have the capacity or resources to handle. Um, and that does interplay with the entire sex industry, right? Has the sex industry always existed though? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I don't know that it's actually going anywhere, but it has always existed. And I do, I do think we've got some really hopeful signs about that because 10 years ago even, when I was first really beginning to take my advocacy career and shift away from general domestic violence and sexual assault and do um, this kind of work, it was, well actually it was more than 10 years, let's say it was about 2006 here in Portland. When I would work with the Portland Vice team, they still considered prostitution a vice that women had, right? Like you might have a vice, like maybe you drink too much. Well, some women just love prostitution so much. Can you, <laughs> right, that was 2006. Um, but there were these really great vice officers that said, you know what, we're out there with these women every day and we keep arresting them because it's against the law, but that's not what we see. Like, let me tell you the stories about what we actually see. And they actually approached me and said, and other people, not just me, but they said, we need victims advocates. That's what we really need. Uh, these are victims of crime. And it was the police who were revolutionary enough to say, we can't stand for this anymore. This is not a vice, right? So 10, 20, 10, 12 years ago, we were there. And when I would find someone who needed help and I would call to find them a shelter, I could literally, I, one time I counted 108 phone calls where I said, I have a minor sex trafficking victim. Would you take them in? 
And they would say, nope, that's criminal behavior. We don't have room for them in our shelter. Um, that has changed so much. So I think that what we saw was we've shown, like we put a light on it, right? We saw this huge extreme like numbers deal, right? Where we had all these numbers all of a sudden and we thought, is it getting worse? And I would say, no, we're just beginning to actually quantify the problem, which we still haven't, but we're a lot better. Uh, but with that, you know, as in numbers increase in terms of us just being aware, then come resources and dollars, right? So at this point, when you hear things like Oregon has the highest rate of sex trafficking, that's because in Operation Cross Country, which is that federal initiative, we happen to find the second most minors in the country on one given night. That was a big night. That was a very busy night. However, that's just one night, right? I would say the real difference is we're good at finding kids and we're pretty good at enforcing rules around this topic. So that doesn't mean it's getting worse to me. That means we're just better at actually doing something about it. So my very long-winded answer on that question is I actually think really great things are happening. Um, and I don't know that the numbers are going down. We won't actually be able to give you an, an accurate answer on that for years as we look at stats over time. But I would venture to say it's better now than it's ever been in my career, maybe my lifetime. Um, with that, I've. I think that's all the answers to questions. Do you want me to? Yeah, keep going. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks, Dana. I'll, I guess I'll open it up. I'm open to any more questions. Yeah, I'll start here and just go that way. Oh, the mic. Is there? Perfect. So I'm, so I'm wondering, uh, I'm Gwen Ellen, and um, I saw a program recently where with the younger population of high school students and college age students, they take sex activity much more casually than their parents and grandparents. And so there's sort of this uh, attitude, or the program was suggesting that the attitude is, this is a good way to make money, nobody gets hurt, it's friends with benefits. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you're running into that at all. Mm. I think there's, oh, I have such so many answers to that. I think there is an idea, especially by young people who don't have a lot of dating experience, an idea that comes with, a, I mean, it's coming from a really cool place of like, let's not be judgmental and super legalistic. Like, let's just let people do their thing. And like, not, it, I, I like the idea of being so free to, free of judgment. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't play out. Um, in reality, I think that we're wired for intimacy being one, and not just sexual intimacy, right, but intimacy being one of the most, like, greatest human connections there is, and humans are wired for connection, and that's a really deep, amazing thing. It's not, you, you can't um, make that a shallow thing, right? And so, unfortunately, I see so many kids getting involved, especially on, like, the sugar daddy sites, where it's not quite the sex industry yet, but, you know, like, I could use the fact that I'm beautiful to hopefully, you know, get that laptop for college because my parents can't afford it, things like that. But the problem is, once they're in, I've never seen self-harming behavior, eating disorders. The, the statistics on suicidal ideation are 100%, but attempts, like, 14 times higher than the average sexual assault survivor. Um, all of them turn to drugs and alcohol eventually to cope. That's why you have 30-year-old women who are addicted to meth and heroin who are now living on the streets with no high school education and no job history. It's all a trauma story, right? And so if I could find people who'd been involved who didn't display everything from pers personality disorders, if you want to call it that, um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and suicide attempts, I would feel differently. But the outcomes speak for themselves, and they are, it's not just a few, it's like 100% of the people I work with. Yeah. Sharon? Yes. I used to be a health teacher here in Salem, and yeah. uh, my question involves the seven years average lifespan mm -hmm. was shocking to me. And uh, since I'd been out of it for a while, my question is, you're a natural to come into the uh, classroom and assemblies, and oh. is it part of the state and, uh, and uh, local curriculum because you're reaching the kids there, right. even middle school? Yes. Um, it depends on the school, and I feel bad saying this, but it's almost just based on capacity. We get asked by more schools than we can even go to. Um, so I hope, you know, we're constantly trying to equip more people, and I love that in the last decade, uh, this region of Oregon has equipped many, like, train-the-trainer type um, exposures of new people to the information to help disseminate. Um, I do talk to as many high schools as I can get to every year, and the Aaron's Law um, 
mandate for schools to cover, it can cover everything from sexual abuse prevention, safe touching, teen dating violence, but they also can cover trafficking. So usually under the Aaron's Law um, language that tells schools they have to talk about these topics, they can bring us in there even if the school is resistant. Because sometimes parents are like, ooh, I don't, you know, that's a lot of very adult content. And we can use a sort of more age appropriate conversation, but the, the truth is if they're being recruited at 13, by not talking about it, all we're doing is leaving them in really grave vulnerability. Um, so yes, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, here, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm not okay. sure who's next. Who's next? Okay, <laughs> I'm Jackie, oh, okay. Jackie. And my question has to do with um, a bigger picture about our society. How as a society can we strengthen families and give young people, starting at the very earliest stages, mm -hmm. a sense of value and the ability to understand what's happening to not ha be vulnerable and needy. Mm -hmm. uh, I see this as a problem, and, and there are so many pulls on people today, sports and all these different things, you know, everything that's pulling. What can we do to strengthen families? To actually give you an answer that would do you justice, I'd have to give you a two hour answer. So, and I know that I can't, and I'm also not the only perspective, right? So I, I would just say for the little bit of time that I have and being totally selfish with my own perspective here, I would say, you know, we've got some really great um, evidence-based practice now around primary prevention, and we can implement that literally at grade school level and on. So we know on an educational level some things, but that's, that's not where my heart goes to answer that question. Um, and I'll even, Try not to get emotional. Actually, my answer on this question: the state of the family is in dire straits in our country, and the level of need in the foster system for people to take children in is beyond. It's mind blowing enough that I can't. I, it surprises me, and this is what I do all day long for my job. There, it's literally so bad in the state of Oregon that workers won't remove a kid who needs to be removed and meets the criteria to be removed unless they have a place to put them because they know they don't have enough homes. And so kids are in desperate need and there's nowhere for them to go. And so how we raise our own children, how we raise the children in our neighborhoods, how we take children in that aren't ours, that's where it has to start. So that's my answer, and now I'm emotional. So I would say that takes me back to in a hopeful place, back to my thing about our involvement in all the children's lives, in all of our lives, right? Then it's not a talk about sex trafficking, it's a talk about family, and it's talk about respect, and it's talk about consistency and love and boundaries, which we all can do. So that makes me excited, because every single person can leave here and do that. So thank you for your time. I'm gonna hand it over to Dana Clark. I'd like to thank Esther for coming and joining us this afternoon. I knew that she had a depth of knowledge. There are many things that you as citizens of your community, communities can do. One is to be talking with the schools, make sure that they introduce curriculum, usually through the health department, um, to talk about it. And it's not just talk about trafficking, but it's internet safety internet, it's healthy relationships, because some of these kiddos have come from families that <laughs> getting knocked around a little bit or maybe uh, dad's friend uh, crawling in the bed at night or something like that is common. They don't know that that's not a healthy family. They have not, no perspective or anything to compare it to. So it's important that they get that training, those who don't have families in place, that can help them understand what is right, what's wrong, what's acceptable so that they've got a sign early on to get out of it. The other thing is legislation. Um, there's been some great pieces that have been introduced and passed and they're in place, but it just takes a while for the legislative wheels to go. And I know that the deputy DA in Malta, Multnomah County who also prosecutes federal cases has been trying to change some of the practices of identifying victims of trafficking so their names aren't used so that the trafficker doesn't know who's actually testifying against them. So that's another piece to what Esther was talking. There are 
things in the back I'd like to encourage you to take and read, ask questions, you can contact us. There's also a list of items that most agencies who work with survivors, things that they can always use. I know that occasionally I get a call from an agency and say, we really need some underwear. We need some, you know, just some real basic things for these kids, some socks in the wintertime, some knitted hats. Um, there's also some agencies who use the weighted blankets. Even law enforcement and counselors use those when they're stressed out because they're sitting for hours on end talking to these victims of trafficking. It helps calm them down so they can better help the victims that they're working with. So there's a lot of ways to get involved, and I am hoping that we've motivated you to take a look at something that maybe you can get involved and help with. And thank you again for inviting us here. I'd like to thank Jim for his presentation and Phil for bringing us here. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.